Welcome to the third Lunch and Learn High Tunnels 2015 online workshop. I'm Cheryl Burns, the Project and Outreach Manager for the Capital Resource Conservation and Development Area Council. Capital RC&D is a nonprofit organization that works to conserve our natural resources and promote economic development. We primarily work in the seven county region surrounding Harrisburg, but often host projects that support the entire state. The Lunch and Learn series is funded through partnership with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in Pennsylvania and in collaboration with professionals who have been very generous with their time and talent in agreeing to present through this series. For today's session, Barry Preseason Checkup, we have Kathy Demchek from Penn State Extension. All right. Uh, is my presentation showing up there okay? It is. Okay. All righty. Well, I'm going to um, just go ahead and launch into this. So what we want to talk about is for um, growers who either are growing berries and tunnels or, or even ones who are thinking about it, talk about some of the um, spring issues that you might see and things that you can um, be aware of to, to keep an eye on. Some of this will also apply to growers who, who have field um, raspberries or strawberries as well. And so if you are growing those, you may find them useful in a field situation also. So, um, so in the high tunnels, as far as which berries are typically being grown, um, most commonly um, growers are growing um, raspberries is probably the most common crop. Um, usually um, fall bearing red raspberries. Um, the picture that you see in the bottom of this slide is um, Nantahala. Um, red raspberry, which is a primocane fruiter, meaning that you can cut the canes down in the springtime and the um, plant will send up new canes, which will then produce a fall crop on it. On the left, you also see um, the newest, um, one of the newest varieties of raspberries. This one's called Niwot. It is a primocane fruiting black raspberry, the first one um, that's, that's um, really commercially viable of its kind. And um, that is it over there on the left. And then on the right, we have a primocane fruiting blackberry. Um, this one's Prime Arc 45. And so all of these plants where you can either cut them down in the springtime and um, just get a fall crop off of them, or you can keep the canes from the previous year. Um, when, once they fruit in the fall, um, the, the tip that has already fruited will die, um, but then the following spring the plants will resume fruiting below the point on the cane where they stopped fruiting the previous fall. And so then you can get a summer crop off of any of these as well. And then we'll also be talking um, about strawberries. Um, over on the left, you see um, a day-neutral strawberry um, that is growing in um, just in, the, in a plastic culture type system in a high tunnel. Um, we've also grown our strawberries um, in the upper right. You see them in permanent raised beds that are made out of non-treated wood um, where we have grown, grown the plants that way as well. That's worked um, quite well also. And then in the bottom right, um, this is a strawberry variety called Mara des Bois, and that is a day-neutral strawberry that is highly flavored. And there it's being grown in the gutter system. Um, you can't actually see the um, gutter right under the plants, but if you look towards the top of the picture, you can see um, the gutter of um, a row of gutters that is above, above the one that you're looking at with the plants. And so um, that's also another option. Of all of these, um, really the easiest has just been in a plastic culture system in a tunnel, um, at least for, for me. Um, but certainly if you're interested in looking at other things, you know, that's, that's an option too. So, um, so late winter and early spring is a good time to be looking at things, um, especially for the raspberries and blackberries before um, any new canes start coming up where you have a lot more vegetation and the weeds start growing. Um, it's kind of a good time to look at your, your plants and see um, what you might otherwise be missing. Um, with strawberries also, um, you just have less foliage out there and so there are a, certain, a, a couple of pests that we can check for. Um, and strawberry fields as well. So um, this past winter, of course, was um, a little bit um, harsh, maybe um, in some ways, with, with low temperatures and winds. And so one of the first things we want to be aware of is that the plants can suffer some winter injury. 
And so one of our first things we'll normally be checking for in the springtime um, is signs of winter injury on our plants. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so when berries are in the tunnels, they will be protected to a, to a good extent. You know, chances are strawberries that are in the ground um, are going to be um, fine. If they are in a tunnel where you didn't have plastic on it or a three-season tunnel, um, you can potentially, you know, have the same type of damage that you would from being in the field. Generally, we'll put either straw or row covers over strawberries, and so usually they'll come through. Um, one thing I am concerned about is that last um, November, um, at the beginning of the month, we really had a pretty steep drop in temperatures um, right in the fall, and so there could have been some damage that could have even happened then, though, before people would have had a chance maybe to put on row covers or straw. Um, on the cane berries um, and blueberries, um, we list some critical temperatures. These are the temperatures that the plants can take if they're completely dormant. If they weren't completely dormant, then they can be injured at temperatures higher than these. And so the ones that we're, we're you know, mainly concerned about um, here is, is blackberries, um, black raspberries to some extent, but they'll, you know, chances are they're, they're going to um, come through okay in a tunnel. So. Let's take a look at what you might be doing um, to check your plants. So on strawberries, normally the first thing you'll do is cut through the crowns, and the damage that you might see is going to show up right in the crown area. That's sort of a storage organ for the plant um, where there are carbohydrates there. Um, and so if you take a look at that, um, the, you basically will see different colors depending on whether the crown is injured or not. We'll show you some pictures of those. With blackberries and raspberries, you you actually want to cut through buds to check to see whether perhaps the flower buds or the entire buds are dead. Sometimes it's pretty difficult to see that because those buds are very small. And so it helps if you cut um, some of the branches or canes first and just put them in water for you know three to four days. Um, and then they'll start to plump up and expand a little bit and it will be easier for you to see what's going on. Um, it, you know, we can see them okay in the lab if we're looking through a microscope, but if you're trying to look at them with a, you know, magnifying glass or something, it's it's much more difficult. Okay, so strawberries, um, if you um, take a look at a strawberry crown that's been cut through, um, this is one that has suffered some winter injury, and so um, you can see right in this part of the crown, there's sort of this, this creamy color. That is really the color that the entire crown should be. And then we see some browning down here, um, also some browning up at the top. Um, generally, you know, the browning down here in this is in this bottom area is what will be the most concerned. And so, if you cut through a crown um, and see this discoloration, that means that some injury did occur. Okay. Now, um, I want to point out that when you cut through a strawberry crown, it will oxidize just, just like an apple will if you cut an apple where it will start to turn rusty colored. And so if you cut through the crown and you know you don't look at it right away, you, that, that could be confusing or, or you set it down and you come back and look at it. And if, you, if you see it turning brown after you've cut it um, you know, a few minutes later, you don't need to be concerned about that. That's normal. Now, even when a crown is injured to this extent, um, there, are, there is still enough healthy tissue that um, the plant can continue to translocate nutrients and, you will, um, and water, and so you will see the plant continue to grow and the berries will expand. What we do run into sometimes is that the plant appears to be perfectly fine right up until the point where it starts trying to ripen a lot of fruit and then it's just trying to move too much through um, an injured area and sometime the plant, sometimes the plants will collapse. So, um, you know, so they may look fine for a long time, but then when you get into the, the peak of harvest, um, not look quite so good anymore. So now if you have a lot of winter injury, this entire crown area may be, may be a rust color when you cut through it and then, then that plant is in very serious trouble, not likely to be able to produce much of a crop. On blackberries, okay, this, what we are looking at over here is um, undamaged buds um, that were basically, you know, with 
they were on the stem and we just cut through them um, with a knife. And so if you take a look, the leaves um, that are going to be eventually expanding are to the outside of the bud. And the floral parts are right in this central area right here. This big bud you're looking at is a primary bud. And so that's the one that the plant will normally um, push out. A lot of um, a lot of varieties will only push out one primary bud, um, but some will also have a secondary, well, a lot of them will also have a secondary bud for at least um, a certain proportion of the, of, the, um, of the primary buds, and that varies with the cultivar. So um, it might only be like 10% of the, the um, bud areas um, will have both the primary and secondary bud. In other cases, it may be 40%. It just depends on the variety. But what this is is um, a bud that can compensate for some damage to the primary bud. So if you take a look over in the picture on the right, um, you'll see where this, this brown area um, in the center is actually a flower bud that was um, that was killed. And, and it's not just one bud, it's a compound bud. So there are several flower buds in there and they are all dead. Um, and then you see the secondary, however, appears to be um, okay. And so that would be able to compensate, um, grow and compensate for some of the yield loss from the primary bud. So um, I had mentioned in those earlier pictures that the floral um, bud parts would be in the in the center of that entire bud, and so that's what's referred to as a compound bud. So if you take a look at um, this this cane right here on a blackberry, you can see that that you know we have what would have been that primary bud would have been right down in here. The secondary would have been right here, but this is this is later when they've actually um, expanded, and so you see the leaves that have emerged, and then you also see um, the flower buds that ha have emerged in the in the center um, of those. And here, both the primary and secondary buds are breaking. This is likely the variety. Um, Illini hardy, which tends to do this a lot, where it, it'll have you know multiple um, buds at each node, and so it tends to um, it's not it's not necessarily purely winter hardy that gives it that name, um, Illini hardy, but it does um, compensate for damage very very nicely. Okay, so then when the flower buds are killed, again this is going back to that picture we had seen earlier, where you see that this the, the flower buds. Um, are, are killed off. And what that shoot would look like when it emerges is the one you see on the right, where you see these leaves emerging fine there to the exterior um, part of the bud here and to the exterior of this um, shoot right here. There should be a flower bud emerging from the center right here where this, you know, the front leaf is pulled down. But there isn't, um, and that's because it, it had been killed off. Also, if you look at these um, leaves on this particular bud, um, you will see that um, they look a little bit distorted. This is actually somewhat normal for flower buds as well, um, where they almost appear like they have a little bit of a growth regulator type of injury, perhaps. Um, but, but all it is is winter injury um, that's just causing them to look a little distorted. And then what normally happens later on is that the canes um, will leaf out to some extent. You may find um, that you know some of them appear to be leafing out normally. Some may you know be leafing out only on lower, low, lower portions of the cane. And um, this is typical of symptoms of, of winter damage. Um, this is blackberries we're looking at here, but um, raspberries. Um, would look very similar to this. Um, the difference is that these are plants that had been tipped the previous summer, so you have a lot of lateral shoots. You may not have those lateral shoots, for example, on a red raspberry, and what you'll just see is a single um, main cane that has leaves, um, only the bottom part of the stem or not at all. Now, that's not to be confused with frost damage. This is what happens when um, the flower buds um, have already emerged um, and um, may have opened up, um, and we encounter, you know, cold temperatures that might be, you know, just in the upper 20s or low, um, you know, 30 even um, is is right on the edge. But if you if you look at these buds, 
um, you know, they, they emerged fine, everything was okay, but what happened was that we got cold temperatures after, after they emerged and a portion of them was killed. And so here in the blackberry, um, this is actually the center part, um, which is the stigma um, that gets killed at slightly lower temperatures. These are actually the anthers we're looking at over here. And so they would still come out. If this flower bud opened up, it would look like just like this strawberry blossom over here on the right. And that is one that was open. Um, this one um, was um, at an earlier stage, and it was completely killed off. This one, only the, the um, stigma was, was injured in the um, center portion of the flower. But on either of these, you're not going to have any fruit. Now, um, related to winter injury is um, some of the diseases that we have. And so this is one in particular. Um, what we find sometimes is that there can, there can be injury to the, the cane or the bark um, of a plant, and um, it allows some disease organisms basically to be able to get in. Um, so pneumonia stem canker is one that seems to be a lot worse when, when plants are winter injured, and this is one that's an issue on blackberries, and we're looking at that right here. So you see here that we have some... Um, some buds that have, have sort of leafed out, not, not very vigorously, and one that hasn't. And it's really difficult to, you know, sort out in these situations what was first, the chicken or the egg, you know, was there winter injury which then caused the canker to be an issue, um, or was it the other way around? We don't really know, but um, it is, you know, obvious that the plant is not going to do well. Um, in pneumonia stem canker, there are some early early symptoms that you can watch for. Um, there's this um, chocolate brown color and sort of a reddish um, area right where the healthy tissue or the, the injured, um, the infected tissue is beginning to, beginning to invade the healthy tissue. And if you look, um, you'll see this sort of silvering um, color on an area that has been infected for longer. If you look up at the previous slide, this is, you know, the silvering that's happening here. Um, and so in the springtime, sometimes you'll see, just as the plants are beginning to leaf out, you'll see a lot of these chocolate brown lesions and then also some silvering on them, and that's typical of that problem. This is a variety triple crown, and it seems to be especially um, susceptible to, to this issue. We don't really know a whole lot about this disease, except we do know that fungicides don't have a lot of effect, and so we do recommend um, thorough, thorough pruning. Um, there is a material that we'll typically put on in the springtime called lime sulfur, and that will um, that will basically help with control of a number of different disease organisms, um, and that can be put on um, with blueberries in the fall as well. Not it's not labeled for that on the other um, berry crops. Okay, and then crown gall is um, one that's actually a bacterial problem. And so when you're pruning, and this is when the time of year, this, is take, this picture was taken a little later, but often when you're pruning and these leaves aren't out here and you're going through the field, you'll notice something that looks like uh, basically what it is is a, a tumor on the plant that's a dark brown color. This, this tumor would have been present um, the previous year um, or, or maybe even earlier than that um, because they do persist for some time. But um, typically they'll start out as a small white um, area of, of callus growth, which is you know, basically undifferentiated growth. And um, it is unfortunately a disease that is systemic throughout the plant. And it may be, you know, latent in the plant um, and not become obvious until there's some sort of a wound, either from pruning or from winter injury. Um, sometimes you'll see these galls um, typically, you know, form, form in the crown area. There's another related disease called cane gall, and there the galls will form further up on the on the cane wherever there's a wound, but they'll look very similar to this, just just smaller. And so that's another thing that we like for people to keep an eye out for. So if you find that you have that, um, you know, the question is what to do. And what's, you know, best is to dig out any plant that's infected, um, take that completely out of the area, and then also some of the surrounding ones because it's likely that there are root, um, you know, portions of the root system um, that are infected, and those may um, be, um, you know, what, what is the material from which other canes are um, coming up from. And so we want to go ahead and, and get, um, 
all that tissue out of there. So the galls can survive for quite some time. Um, sometimes this disease can come in on um, the, the plants because it is systemic. And so you want to be sure you're getting your plants from a nursery that is, you know, watching for these. Um, if you're getting plants from a neighbor or perhaps, a, you know, more of a um, fly-by-night type nursery, um, you can buy in plants that are already infected with crown gall but that look perfectly normal and you don't realize that there was an issue until, you know, two or three years down the road. Okay, now another disease we can look for as we're doing our, our pruning um, or it's just, you know, we're out walking through the field in early spring or, or your tunnel in this case um, is anthracnose and that will typically show up um, as these oval lesions on the stem here and that's sort of one, one thing that we often use for um, looking at what might be a disease relative to just some sort of injury is that typically you will see some sort of a, um, you know, a, a shape I guess is a way to find shape to, to, the, um, to, the, to the injury. Um, symptoms. And so typically with diseases you may see different colors where here the center is tan, then there's sort of a, you know, it, it, it becomes more darker tan over time. Um, it has a, a dark edge to it and then there's the healthy tissue around that it's beginning to invade. And so when you see those different colors of um, of tissue, that's generally, you know, can, can be an indication that you might have a disease issue instead of just, you know, some sort of injury. Um, and often what you'll notice is that the color changes over time so that you might have some sporulation taking place in the center of these lesions. Eventually they will actually become kind of black and spores will be produced and so you'll see that happening as opposed to injury where you just, you have an injury, it's that color and it, you know, it, you may have tissue around a dye but basically stays that color. Um, so what you can do for this is, is print thoroughly if you see any canes that see these, have these types of um, lesions on them, you'll want to get those out of there. Now, I, I don't want you to confuse this with just, you know, when you're working with canes that have thorns on them, they, you know, if you have wind, you can have some scratches take place, you can have some, you know, poking take place of one cane um, injuring a neighbor, and so, you know, don't go into a panic. These, these lesions we're looking at here will, will tend to grow over time, um, and it'll become more apparent that it's a problem. So this one is not you know, as common in high tunnels um, as, as it is in the field, but we do still see it um, at low levels from time to time. And then this is one that we have, problem that we have seen in um, high tunnels is late leaf rust. Now this is a rust that um, is not systemic. Um, I mentioned not to be confused with orange rust. That's because orange rust is a systemic disease. You'll see rust, rust um, showing up in the springtime um, as the new growth is coming out um, and beginning to elongate. So generally, you know, end of May, beginning of June, um, you'll see orange pustules on the leaf undersides. That, that is a spring disease and that is one that is very serious. Um, and it's systemic, so you can only dig the plants out. That's really your only control from that. However, what we want to talk about is late leaf rust, and this one is not systemic, and so it can be cured. It's not, you know, not one that you need to completely panic over. But what you might see at this time of the year is um, on res red raspberries and is what appears to be some um, rust pustules um, on the canes themselves, like in the cracks of them at the base. Um, those plants would have had a rust on the leaves um, last fall, but but it may not have been noticed because it's just not that um, not always that obvious. And usually, what people notice instead is that they see some little um, little rust um, rust colored areas on their berries first. That's the first thing they usually see. And so, if you take a look at these berries on the left, um, you can see that they're um, Right in here, okay, and right in here, this isn't totally in focus, but basically some of the little individual droplets um, have a rust on them, and so not, you know, not, not the most appealing. Um, those little rust colored areas will just look like the rust um, that is on the under, that would have been on the undersides of the leaves at the same time, but like say often we don't notice, notice it on the leaves, so you'd see these same type, types of pustules on the fruit. 
And so we have seen this from time to time. So basically where we've seen it is on the leaf undersides of um, any of the ras raspberries, either red or black. We've seen it only on the fruit of red raspberries, and we've seen it only on the cane of red raspberries. So even though you may see this rust um, from this disease on the undersides of black raspberry leaves, we haven't actually seen it move to the fruit or the canes. Um, so it's only the red raspberries where, you know, we're saying you can be watching for symptoms in the spring. Okay, so um, white leaf rust um, is one that, again, may come in on nursery plants. So white spruce can be an alternate host um, for late leaf rust, and so we often, you know, we think that often when we have issues with it on red raspberries, the spores probably have blown in from some spruce that were in the area. Um, best thing you can do, especially in a tunnel circulation, is just to, or in tunnel situation, is to prune these, um, you know, canes that, that have any symptoms of rust on them out of the planting. And then um, basically anything that increases your air circulation in that tunnel um, and, and just, you know, how quickly foliage dries um, will help with control of that. So powdery mildew is one of the most common diseases that we see in, um, in high tunnels. And that's because with powdery mildew, it's a disease that um, thrives under conditions of high temperatures and high humidity. And that's when you have the greatest disease incidence. It is, un unlike almost any other disease, it's one where free water, meaning like rainfall or overhead irrigation, um, actually can help control the disease. And because that washes off the, um, the spores off of the plants, the powdery mildew spores off, and once they are on the ground, they can't really germinate and infect the plant. This one needs to be on the plant to be able to, um, you know, really, really have much effect. Now, it can be windborne, but once, you know, the spores have hit the ground, um, you don't generally have nearly the issue. So since generally in tunnels we have high humidity, we have high temperatures, and we don't have rainfall, um, it can be more of a problem. So you want to watch for symptoms. Um, if you have um, especially um, strawberries that are underneath row covers, you may want to check um, leaves for any symptoms of powdery mildew. Um, on especially you'll see maybe on the leaf, leaf underside, sometimes on the upper surface. We'll take a look at that. So with strawberries, um, typically um, what people will notice sometimes first is that the leaves appear to be curling up even though the plants aren't, aren't wilted um, and have sufficient moisture. And now on these leaves right here, on some of them we are seeing some symptoms of leaf hopper damage. Um, and so we have that in this field also. But basically, you know, what What's really the um, symptom that we're looking at here is just the fact that these leaves have curled up the way that they have along the edges. And um, then often what you will notice is, is this you know, powder, and that's how we get the name powdery mildew on the fruit. So here we have um, a strawberry that, you know, where if you look at it, the, almost the entire fruit surface is affected. Also note that the seeds are colonized as well. Okay, and then here's one where just, you know, down the lower portion of the fruit where it's resting on a leaf and the humidity was higher, we have a pretty good case of powdery mildew going on there. The other, other berries are okay. This one is um, the cultivar seascape on the left. Um, also notice it's not, not an especially great looking fruit in terms of, of fruit size or shape. Um, sometimes you can, the berry won't expand quite normally if it's, the entire thing has been colonized um, with powdery mildew. Um, and this is the cultivar Monterey, um, both are day neutrals, and um, yeah, and so Monterey does get it, but not as badly as Seascape. Now, um, sometimes you will first notice that there is actually just the um, powdery mildew itself on the leaf, and the leaves haven't necessarily curled up so much. Um, that happens more commonly when, when the leaf you're looking at is a younger leaf. Um, it may have just not reached the point, you know, where it's ready to start curling. Okay, and then um, the other thing that people sometimes complain about is that they notice that the seeds are falling off of their strawberries when they pick them. And that um, can also be a symptom of powdery mildew. If you notice here, this is a fruit that's infected with powdery mildew. And when you look at it, um, 
up closely you see that it's actually around the seeds that some um, of the colonization was um, taking place. I don't really know if that's a matter of you know timing when when the disease moved in or variety or exactly what what the situation is there but you know like I said often you know what will happen is you'll pick that fruit up these seeds in fact you can see one right here one had fallen off um, you'll pick it up and if you rub it at all the seeds just fall right off very easily. Now this was one really extreme case um, with seascape and I have only seen this happen one time but I just want people to be aware that it can happen um, you know concerned in tunnels that if if you have a, a very you know humid environment um, that's warm that that it can get pretty severe. What was happening was that I had a call from a grower that none of his berries were um, sizing up correctly. And so this was basically what the berries were looking at. And I was totally baffled by that one because I had never, you know, I was certain it had to be tarnished plant bug or something that was feeding, you know, on the developing flowers and berries. Um, and it turned out, you know, and then he said, no, I don't, you know, I don't think I have any tarnished plant bugs out there. So went for a visit and um, I mean he was right, he didn't, but the berries looked terrible. And what was actually happening was I opened up some of the flower blossoms and the powdery mildew fungus had actually gotten inside of the the powdery milk of the flower blossoms and had colonized the stigma and the anthers and so there was no way those plants could pollinate themselves very well. Um, you know if the stigma was colonized there was nothing there to pollinate um, and if the anthers were, were damaged pollen wasn't being released and so basically you ended up with these berries that just didn't form. And like I said it's a ex really extreme case I just want to be people to be aware it can happen. So some of the control measures for powdery mildew, first anything that encourages air circulation, that'll help lower the humidity and dry things out. Um, some of the bicarbonate products like potassium bicarbonate um, work, work fairly well. I have heard of some issues especially with raspberries which can get powdery mildew upon occasion <clears throat> that um, that you can get phytotoxicity issues and then the leaves fall off so really you know want you to you know, not, not overuse it, watch the temperatures under which you might apply it. Um, probably when the temperatures are cooler will be better. And then there are some biological controls you can use. Um, one product in particular, for example, that comes to mind is AQ10. This is actually a, um, what's referred to as a hyperparasite. It's a fungus that actually eats the powdery mildew fungus. And so we actually had used that in our high tunnels and that worked fairly well. Um, you can also use some of the standard fungicides like um, things that are um, like Nova or Rally or things that are in the strobilorin class like pristine um, work fairly well. The problem is that we are seeing some resistance to these fungicides and so if you use them and you notice that you're not getting good control, it may just be that um, you have a resistant population there and you'll need to try something else. Okay, so um, that's pretty much it on the diseases that we want to be watching for um, at this um, time of year and so I want to move into insects and mites you want to be looking for too. And again um, this is something that you know often if you're pruning either raspberry or blackberry canes um, that you you know have a good opportunity to be looking at those canes and what's happening with them. So red -lit cane borer is a very common pest. Um, it's more um, common when you're close to woods um, or wild raspberries or blackberries and this is one that will cause a swelling on the cane and usually that swelling is within about the bottom foot um, of the cane and you will start seeing that um, any time from July on. The problem is that during the summer you have a lot of you know canes that are coming up in different places and you have leaves on the plants and so often you don't notice that swelling until the leaves have all fallen off. And so if you take a look at the swelling the reason that it occurs is that um, there was, a, you know, an adult um, red net cane borer which um, had laid an egg in the um, in the, in the actual cane, and then what that egg did was it. Um, started um, tunneling, it, it hatched and then the small larvae started tunneling around the, the cane um, 
going basically circularly around it right underneath the bark right here. And so if you cut down through the cane lengthwise, you wouldn't see any, um, you know, you wouldn't really see much damage at, at that point. And so what you really need to do is peel that bark off and then you look and you see right in all of these places here, you can see these tunnels um, that were spirally made around the cane. And so the, the larvae, um, you know, made the spiral pattern and then it headed as it got bigger. It could, it could burrow into the cane more. And so it either went up or it went down. Um, it sometimes will go one direction and then reverse. But typically they'll eventually tunnel towards the bottom of the cane. And so what we recommend is that if you have canes where you see this sort of swelling in the springtime, you cut that cane completely out. If you notice that this is happening in the summer, you might you know, be able to cut it off maybe a foot below the swelling um, and still have some cane left if it happened to have happened higher up on the cane. But generally, you know, if you cut off a foot below the swelling, you're generally taking the entire cane out. Okay, so, so what you want to do is, you know, as soon as you notice any symptoms of damage, you want to get those canes out of there um, quickly. And, um, you know, you can't really use any kinds of insecticides that will have any effectiveness against this because the larvae are inside the canes and they're pretty much protected there from anything you might apply. And there's another pest called crown borer. Um, this is one where it has a longer life cycle, so it'll be present in the canes for two to three years. And if you take a look um, at, at this, um, you see a larvae right here, okay, and there's the head of it. So there's, in this crown there were actually several um, you know, several several larvae that were tunneling around in there. And then there's, this was actually to the outside um, on the ground was a pupae. And so basically what you're looking for, is, what, you'll, what growers will generally notice first, is that a plant isn't sending up very many new canes. And that's just a sign that something's happening either to the root system or the crown. And then um, when they're pruning in the springtime, they'll often notice, you know, some of these tunnels um, through the, through the, through the, um, crown area. And so basically um, there's you know only you know a, a few things you can do. One, one is pruning to try to get that out, um, you know any, any injured air, um, tissue out of the out of the plant. Um, and the problem is that often by the time you notice there are enough larvae in there that you know you might be better off just digging the plant out completely. Um, it tends to be more of a problem on blackberries. And one of the things with blackberries is they can sometimes be weeds. And so with this one, we had a terrible infestation in one of our high tunnels, um, one of our high tunnels full of blackberries. And we actually dug all of the plants out because they just gave up on managing it. And what actually happened was there was enough roots left in there that the plants send up all, all sorts of docanes. And we actually ended up back in production the next year, which, you know, surprised the heck out of me. So anyway, so other things, other options you have though, if you are growing primocane fruiting, um, blackberries or, or raspberries, because they can, they can get affected by this one as well. Um, if you cut the canes all the way to the ground, that basically breaks the cycle um, of, of these um, borers from being able to enter the plant and then persist um, in it and also um, exposes them to predators. Now, one thing I want to mention that's not a borer, and I get a lot of phone calls on this one. Um, with some of our plants, this is black raspberry in particular, you'll see that there's this hole in the tip um, of the cane. And um, right here is what we're looking at. So these are canes that would have been um, tipped last summer. And so with them being, this one in particular being a primocane fruiter, this was Niwot, um, we would have trimmed the, the dead tips off of um, the plants in the, in the um, springtime when we were doing our winter pruning. With typical summer bearing black raspberries, we'll often remember, we'll often recommend tipping, tipping them um, in the summertime as well. But generally what happens is that um, if you have canes that have a soft pith to them, like a red raspberry or a black raspberry, and you cut that cane, um, this is really a perfect area for some of the solitary bees um, to, lay, to, to lay eggs. So they'll, they'll burrow into the, that soft tip right there, make a hole that 
might go down three, you know, three to four inches um, maximum, and they'll lay a series of eggs in here along the length of the cane, and then those young, and then they'll, they'll actually seal it with frass, so it won't be obvious at first, but then some of the bees will start to emerge, and they'll break through, and they'll come out, and they'll be pollinators. Um, and so growers, you know, often are concerned about these. I've had a couple of people call me and tell me that they thought they had a borer, they cut all these tips out and burned them, and I was like, no, it's your, it's your pollinators. But, um, but what you can do um, with this is if you, if you notice something like this and you're concerned, you can cut it, you know, five or six inches down the length of the cane and look and see. If there isn't a tunnel that's continuing down there, this was just a pollinator, and then you just take that, that section that you cut and you put it somewhere nice and dry, um, and if everybody isn't hatched out of there by now, they can continue, you know, by the time you do that, they can continue to hatch out. And this is very, you know, very common that we see. Um, now there's one other cane borer I do want to mention that um, you may have issues with. You won't see symptoms of this now, but I want you to you know, be watching for it during the summertime. And this is raspberry cane borer. Typically what will happen is you, um, you will first notice that the tips are wilting, like this one is here. And there is, um, if you look at this, um, you will see that right here and right here there are two, two lines of puncture wounds. And that was what the adult female made. And then she laid an egg right in between there. Um, and typically what happens then is that the, you know, the egg will hatch and then the larvae will tunnel down through the cane. If you um, look at, um, if, if you don't notice that right away and look at it, you might notice later that you have a dead tip. And if you look at that tip, you will see those two lines of puncture wounds. The arrows that are coming in from the left are pointing towards those two lines of puncture wounds. And then there is a hole right um, in the very middle, and that is where the female had laid her egg. Um, Often what will happen is that, you know, af at some point after the larvae has hatched and moved down the cane, um, that dead tip may break off at either of those lines of, of puncture wounds. And if it broke off at the lower one, um, if you look at it, you will see where there is this hole right in the center, and that's where the larvae was tunneling down through, down through the cane. So somewhere down there, there's, there's a larvae, and that, that shoot needs to be trimmed out of there, somewhere um, below you know, where there's, there is a hole. So if you keep cutting through, um, you should be able to locate the larvae if you keep cutting off pieces down that length of that cane. Okay, so another, another um, problem that, that we have, can have in high tunnels um, and often do is two-spotted spider mites. So um, the conditions in high tunnels are really pretty much perfect for them. They like dry conditions and they like warm conditions, sort of not unlike powdery, well, powdery mildew likes high humidity. Spider mites don't like high humidity, but they do like it to be dry and they like it to be warm. So, um, so if you look at the leaves now, you may see mites, um, two-spotted spider mites. The adult females will overwinter as, female, uh, as um, females that are ready to lay eggs, and generally they'll be more of kind of an orangish-red color right now. And unfortunately, some of our predators are that um, same color. The, di the thing that differentiates them um, is the speed with which they move. The predators tend to be a lot faster in moving around. Um, this is what spider mites look like typically during the season. So you can see the um, adult is um, in, in the black circle in the upper left quadrant of the picture. And um, the reason they have the name two-spotted spider mites is because you actually see these two black dots. That's actually like waste material and tissue that they've eaten that's inside their, their bodies. Um, the eggs of two-spotted spider mites will be these little clear spherical eggs. You really need a magnifying glass to see those. But you'll notice in this picture that there are a lot of eggs relative to the number of mites. So we see one mite um, and you know a whole bunch of eggs. And so sometimes what will happen um, is, is you'll um, hear reference to a spider mite explosion, and that's because these can multiply very quickly under the right conditions, and suddenly you have a big, a big issue. Um, if the populations get high enough, you'll notice that this, the foliage starts to look um, almost a bronze color and a little bit dusty. Um, there will also be some stippling, and that means that um, Basically, some of the cells of the tissue um, is injured, and it, it sort of bleaches out. 
and so um, then the the, the You'll, you'll see sort of this lightening of the leaves, and then you'll see them actually bronzing eventually. Sometimes if populations get high enough, you'll actually see a lot of webbing, and that's why, where we get the name spider mites. Um, and if you see these symptoms, it's really almost too late to like relate, do a predatory release or use biological controls to control them at this point. And this is a picture of what um, that dustiness looks like. It almost looks like people walked through the tunnel and kicked up a lot of dry, dry soil and dust onto the leaves, but um, it's really not any soil at all on the leaves. It's just that, that um, webbing and bronzing from spider mite injury in, injury in this tunnel. So, um, so, so basically, we already covered some of this. The temper, the, the females, you know, are ready to lay eggs starting in the springtime. Um, things do tend to stay warmer under the row covers, so sometimes people will pull row covers off of their strawberries in the springtime, and find that they have some areas that are looking fairly weak in terms of growth, and that. Um, Sometimes when you check them, you will find that there are actually quite a few spider mites out there that have been feeding on those plants over the winter. If the temperatures are warm enough, you can produce a new generation in about seven days. So that um, you know, lends to that spider mite explosion problem that you can have. A female can lay 70 eggs. So it doesn't take too long if you multiply you know, 1 times 70 times 70 times 70 that you can end up with a lot of spider mites very quickly. So, um, so if typically if the plants have insufficient moisture, you end up with more spider mites. So that's kind of a, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it, it, it just is. And oddly enough, for if the if you have plants that are along a dusty road, sometimes you will have bigger spider mite issues. And whether it's that, you know, they like dry conditions and it's sort of like, I don't know, talcum powder on them or something keeps them nice and dry and comfy. I don't know what it is, but um, definitely we see the worst problems along, along dirt roads. So that, you know, you might want to consider where you put your raspberries or strawberries or other two-spotted mite susceptible crops. Um, in greenhouses, if plants have a lot of nitrogen, it seems like the spider mite populations tend to be higher. And so, you know, when you put this all together and you're in high tunnels, um, typically, you know, you can get into some big issues. One thing I do want to mention is that in, in part because we have a new invasive insect called spotted wing drosophila for which growers are using broad spectrum ins insecticides, um, when they do that, often they um, kill off the beneficial predatory mites that may have been out there keeping a population, you know, a relatively low population of two-spotted spider mite under control. Because a lot of these insecticides, for some reason, seem to um, kill off the predators, but the spider mites, um, at least a portion of them, escape. Um, you know, being being injured or killed, and then there are some studies that show that neonicotinoids um, actually make two-spotted spider mite females lay more eggs. So that's not not a very good situation. Um, so anyway, so that now there are some some materials that um, you can apply that are are labeled as safe to the adults, um, the adult predatory mites but they do seem to slow down how many larvae, um, yeah, how, many, how, how well the predatory mite larvae do and um, how much egg laying they do as well. So, so, um, so insecticides do tend to be, you know, often the broad spectrum ones um, tend to make spider mite issues worse. So things that you want to do um, if you have had issues with spider mites or think you might, um, you might want to be checking for the, um, spider mites before you put row covers on in the fall, and also check in the spring as soon as you re remove them. Um, look both the, at the tops of the leaves for those um, stippling and bronzing um, symptoms, and then the bottom of the leaves for the spider mites themselves and their eggs. And you may want to do a predatory mite release if you see um, two spotted spider mites out there. Usually there are natural predators that are around, um, but, um, you know, the, the problem is that you may just not have enough of them. So we already mentioned some of these things about the explosions. If you find that you have a lot of two-spotted spider mites out of there, um, and you you know don't 
don't want to use insecticides, um, but you do want to do a release, you can suppress them to some extent by um, hosing off the foliage. Remember we mentioned two spotted spider mites don't really like um, moisture, and so you can hose off the foliage. Um, you can also use insecticidal soap, and that'll help hold the populations back until you can get some predators and get them released. So what we've used um, is a mixture of two spotted spider, or not two spotted spider mites, of predatory mite species, Neosolus phyllaceus, Neosolus californicus, and that's worked well for us in tunnels. Um, one of them provides a quicker knockdown of spider mites, and the other one has more staying power and is able to establish populations and continue to live in the tunnel. Um, what you probably want to do, though, before you um, order predatory mites is talk to the distributor, um, you know, or whoever you're purchasing your, your predatory mites from. They will want to know what your humidity levels are like, what your temperatures are, um, how many two-spotted spider mites you're seeing out there already. And from that, and, and the size vary you're trying to treat, and from that information, they'll be able to make a recommendation on the best species and the best um, number of, um, of predatory mites to order. They'll come in, in thousands, so you know whether you need 1,000, 5,000, or more, um, they'll let you know. And then if you can catch this early and release the predatory mites, we've had the best luck when you know we catch them early and we can treat those hot spots instead of trying to treat an entire big area. One of the other um, problems you can have in high tunnels is aphids. Um, you know, typically in the tunnels you'll have issues with pests that are what we refer to as the greenhouse pests, so the smaller type pests like, um, you know, two-spotted spider mites, white flies, aphids, thrips um, tend to be the bigger, bigger issues. They, um, aphids are a problem on, um, on both strawberries and raspberries because they can transmit viruses in the plants and they um, produce a winged form in the springtime that is um, can, can fly fairly far or at least be moved fairly far along with wind, um, typically downwind. And so we had some issues with strawberries in 2012 and 2013 where the nursery plant supply of strawberries, um, of, of um, what's referred to as plug plants for strawberries um, that was coming out of Canada was severely infected and with, with viruses. And um, there were some aphid issues that were going on in some of those fields. And so they can get moved around, and um, then when you buy those plants, you can buy a, a viral issue in. Now, there's a lot of um, monitoring that's going on of that entire industry, right? right now as far as testing goes to make sure that it's clean now because, you know, the, the producers lost millions and millions of dollars out of that. So anyway, but still you don't want to have, you know, regardless of the plant supply, you don't want to have aphids moving in maybe from wild plants in the area um, because that's a, viruses are actually what have taken out our um, our raspberry plantings and our high tunnels. So you want to be looking at the undersides of the leaves, especially on the new leaves, checking to see if you see any aphids out there. Um, also the same deal with, with white flies and thrips, but um, you know, you may, may want to release some sort of um, you know, generalized general predators to, to help control some of these things. But anyway, um, the other thing you can be looking for is like sometimes we'll notice either um, like sooty mold or honeydew on the leaves and then when you check you see aphids or, or one of these other pests that's, you know, excreting a, a sticky sap. And what's not a sap, it's, you know, sticky. So, and, it's, and it contains sugars and that's why you get these other things growing. So you can use some different um, generalist predators like ladybugs, lacewings, midges, and, and different wasps. Um, or some of the softer insecticides like insecticidal soap are fairly good on these as well. Now one thing I do want to mention, I briefly mentioned spotted wing drosophila. This is a um, pest that um, lays eggs in the fruit as it's starting to ripen. The female pokes a hole into the fruit, lays an egg, and then you end up with larvae in the fruit. Usually what you first notice is that when you pull the um, raspberry off, you'll notice some juice on the, on the receptacle itself. And then if you pull the raspberry itself apart, you will see um, 
some very tiny larvae in there. We've been monitoring for this in high tunnels. At first, we had thought that maybe the high tunnels would be a perfect area for this pest to overwinter, and so we thought we might see worse problems there. We actually have never caught spotted wing Drosophila in tunnels past about the beginning of November or in the, in the springtime. It seems like they move out into the woods um, or go to other protected areas like maybe compost piles, um, piles of brush. Um, the high tunnels apparently just don't afford them enough protection over the winter time. Um, they don't take very cold temperatures. And so the tunnels just aren't warm enough, which is good. And so um, I want to end this with um, a website here where we have a lot of the extension information um, for um, small fruits and also for vegetable production. Um, there are separate sites that also have um, small fruit and tree fruit information on it. But this is one place where we have, you know, a lot of our information related to high tunnels um, is on this particular one. And what I am going to attempt to do is click on this and see if we can get there. Okay, so this is what, what that website looks like. And if you take a look over here on the left, you'll see production guides, you'll see, see fact sheets. Um, you'll also see down here um, courses and workshops and upcoming events and just a lot of information um, in general that you may be able to use. So you can see here that articles have been, um, been being posted and you can click on these, you can get to archived articles, you can get to all sorts of, all sorts of information. Um, and if you go to the fact sheets um, that are over here on the left, um, I started to talk about spotted wing drosophila. That could be in an entire talk in itself. But if you get to that, you will see a series of fact sheets that we have on spotted wing drosophila. Um, each of these will have, you know, a lot of information and pictures um, on how to identify it, you know, just all sorts of information that, that hopefully will be helpful. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty much what I have. If anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to take those and go from there. So if anyone has questions, if you want to um, raise your hand or I can uh, pull folks um, off mute if that's easier for you. Um, as, as we're waiting to see if anyone has any questions, um, Kathy, I'd like to thank you not only for putting together a great presentation, but for taking the time this afternoon um, to share this information with us. I think it's um, important that we be able to have these conversations and get information out um, in this and other formats. So I'd just like to express my appreciation for that. Well, thank you, Cheryl. I appreciated the opportunity. Yeah, my pleasure. So. Um, looks like not a tremendous amount of questions there. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, I'll remind everybody that we also have uh, the ability to ask questions after. So if, you know, you, you go out in your tunnel and you take a look around and see what's happened um, in the winter, and I know uh, I think most of you have indicated through the, the poll that you have not started growing yet, um, growing berries in your tunnels yet. So for those of you that are, if you go out in the tunnels and, and see something and you have a question, you, know, you can use the high tunnel forum or contact Kathy directly. Um, and, and Kathy, I suppose I do have a question for, for those that have not yet started. Um, can you recommend uh, a, a a schedule to do walkthroughs or um, maybe some tips for when they are getting started, uh, how frequently they need to uh, maybe make a concerted effort to pay attention to what's going on and um, anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, so typically, you know, on our, well, one thing is if you are thinking of growing berries in high tunnels is that they do tend to be pretty, um, how do, how do I want to say this? I mean, they're, they're not a low input crop, I guess, would be the way to put it, but I'm not sure really any of the, any of the you know, crops in high tunnels are, you know, they, I mean, you have quite an investment there. And, um, but you also have a lot of potential for a lot of productivity. And so typically, you know, we'll want people to be 
taking a good close look at their plants at least at least once a week, you know, to check for any pests or anything um, like that that might be, you know, any problems that might be brewing out there. Um, typically, though, you know, with getting the plants established, you'll be watering them, you know, normally two to three times a week, and so, you know, hopefully you're there anyway, and it's, you know, easy to, you know, you're in the neighborhood, and, and it's not that big of an area, and hopefully, you know, you have the opportunity to, to keep an eye on things. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Cheryl? It did. Um, and I do see a question here. Um, okay. uh, is it possible that an extremely cold winter will have an effect on the Drosophila population this year? Yes, <laughs> it is. So, you know, last year um, we had a winter that was very similar to this winter in terms of low temperatures and, um, you know, and wind and exposure. And um, our, the spotted wing Drosophila came out about three weeks. You know, we, we started to catch them in traps about three weeks later than usual. And they were also slower for their numbers to increase. And so what happened was most of the producers who were growing, well, stra we're doing bearing strawberries, we pretty much never see an issue with spotted wing Drosophila, not this far north. In the south, they do. Um, summer raspberries and red raspberries and black raspberries producers pretty much got through their harvest season without any real issues. And it was really just the later season um, blueberries and blackberries and then the fall bearing um, raspberries and blackberries that had issues. Now, the populations for the fall crops did eventually increase, you know, to the point where growers were really needing to spray, you know, every every week, and, and we do recommend that they stay on top of the populations, but it wasn't as much, you know, most growers reported spraying about half as much and losing about half as much to spotted wing drosophila overall as they had, you know, in previous years. So yeah, I think the cold weather, I'm, you know, I'm very hopeful that with a similar winter that we'll have the same situation again this year and it won't be quite the issue it has been. And then another question is, um, is spotted wing drosophila unique to strawberries? No, actually, you know, it doesn't bother strawberries much at all. Um, it's, it's a general, it's, it's a more of a problem for raspberries and blackberries. It can affect any thin skin fruit, and that means even non-crop plants. And so, you know, like wild bush honeysuckles, um, they will lay eggs in, in those. Um, Pokeberries, um, any of the raspberries, blackberries, late season peaches, blueberries, anything that's a fruit that has a thin skin on it. Um, not apples, though. But, you know, it's, it's basically all of these softer type fruits, which tend to be the berries. Um, spotted wing drosophila will affect. And so part of the reason we can't, you know, that we're having trouble getting ahead of it or, you know, we can't, like, completely wipe it out for sure because it, it feeds on all these wild hosts. It also can even feed like on, on sap. So if you have a cherry tree that's maybe wounded and, and, and bleeding, it'll feed on that sap. It can feed on oak sap. Um, and so basically anything that, you know, has sugar in it, um, it seems to be able to survive on. And that makes it very difficult, um, you know, to ever get ahead of it. Yeah. Let's see. Um, are there any other questions for Kathy? Nope, oh, here we go. Uh, are traps effective? Okay, so the traps themselves are really just for monitoring. Um, they're not for actually attracting an, a high enough proportion of the population that, you know, you can, you can, you know, wipe them out with traps or, or even keep their populations at bay with traps. It just doesn't, doesn't seem to really be happening. Um, and so, so now there, as, so the traps are really for monitoring, um, for monitoring purposes, they, there is a new lure um, from company Trace, Trace A, which is T-R-E-C-E -E with those little accents over the um, E's. And that seems that that is a bait that you can um, add to your to a vinegar trap. And we were catching um, our spotted wing Drosophila um, at least, depending on the site, it varied from one to three weeks earlier by using that 
that bait in there, so we had a bit more of a heads up um, on when spotted wing Drosophila was present. The problem we were still having is that we were still finding a very low proportion of larvae in the fruit at about the same time. But still, it's something that's a little bit more obvious, um, you know, that you might might be able to notice to, to keep ahead of things. Um, there are there is um, some work being done on developing a trap where um, basically the fruit fly would essentially only need to land on it. Um, we're finding that in the traps, not not all the fruit flies go in, and so there is work being done to develop something that would, you know take out a larger proportion of the, the um, spotted wing Drosophila just by even landing on a trap, but that isn't quite quite there yet. So. Okay. We do have a, a couple more here. Um, Tom wants to know, uh, will neem work for scale or, or, um, or soaps? Ah. Yeah, so normally, you know, with the scale, we'll tend to go with something um, a little bit, you know, heavier duty in terms of some of the dormant, um, like dormant oils, you know, for the scales, or you can go with something like stylet oil. I'm not 100% sure on how effective neem is, so I shouldn't really say that. We'll either go with, you know, like a stylet oil. It, it may work like if you have the crawlers there, so we use the dormant oils to try to um, suffocate the scales when they're, you know, more, more, you know, more dormant. But um, some of the light oil, lighter oils like um, stylet will work on the crawlers. I I don't think we actually have um, that much information on the on the name, or if we do, that's just not something I've worked with. So now I can probably um, mention one other source of information, however, which is we do have the Mid-Atlantic um, Berry Guide. That's something that you can Google online, and in there we do have efficacy ratings for. Um, you know, for various materials and different different pests. Um, and I'm just looking right now to see whether we have, yeah, we do not have a rating, and we have in, that marked as insufficient data for neem um, on skills to really give an answer on that part. Okay. And um, let's see. There's uh, moving away from some of the, the pest control questions, mm -hmm. um, Bob would like to know, does the main strawberry crown multiply itself? Mm. Okay, so the question, so the main strawberry crown, it, it doesn't like multiply itself in a way that you could like divide or turn into, you know, multiple plants, but you do have branch crowns form on it, and so it will get fatter over time, um, so, so there will be basically side crowns that come out um, on that main crown, and each of those can produce a flower, flower truss, um, well, one or two flower trusses, and so the plant will basically get heftier, I guess would be the way to describe it over time, and produce a greater number of fruit. The problem is that when that happens, um, it will also produce smaller fruit because it's basically competing it for, with itself, and so often growers, you know, or homeowners will notice that the, the, the berry size drops off as that crown, you know, basically becomes larger over time. Okay. So yeah, but but as far as like propagation, the main you know main way of propagating you know is is the runners. And, and then another is um, what's the best time to fertilize berry crops? Mm. Okay, so so that's going to vary with with which berry crop you're growing. Um, so with our raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries, we'll typically recommend um, fertilizing. Um, and it also depends on what type of fertilizer you're using. If you're using something granular, um, we'll generally recommend, um, we, we do have some tables in the Mid-Atlantic Berry Guide on amounts of fertilizer to apply that will vary depending on the type of plant you have um, and the, um, the age of the plant and also um, in some cases the, the soil type. And, and that is outlined in pretty well in there. But 
what we do with granular fertilizers is we recommend um, putting half of the fertilizer that you'd, you'd normally apply on um, as the plants are just beginning to leaf out in the springtime and then the other half about four to six weeks later because the plants really aren't taking very much up until they're they're beginning to grow and um, you'll make better use of the fertilizer if you you know if you if you spread out um, how often you apply it instead of it just being one big dose you know that then a good portion of that leaches away you can you can break it into smaller doses and fertilize more frequently but um, but we still recommend the same total amount um, and you know that you get it all on by you know about the probably the middle of June, you know, early July um, at the at the latest. Now, if you're using like a soluble fertilizer, that way we'll tend to break into even more small doses and apply, um, you know, over the entire spring season and early summer. On strawberries, we will recommend um, fertilizing them. Um, generally, we'll incorporate some fertilizer before planting, and then we'll give them um, a light shot of fertilizer, like the equivalent of you know, 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre, we'd have to calculate that back to smaller areas. But then we'd normally fertilize them um, when they're starting to push out runners if they're in a matted row system, or um, and then later in the summer if they're in a matted row system. If they're in a plastic culture system, we'll generally put fertilizer on before planting, and then um, we'll fertilize them in the springtime over the course of you know, from the time that they begin to grow until they're into about the second week of harvest and just a lot of small doses of a soluble, soluble fertilizer that totals about the equivalent of 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Well, it looks like maybe that's um, all for now. Okay. But, um, but again, thank you. And, and for everybody that's uh, been participating on the webinar. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule today to participate. Um, I'll follow up with uh, an email sometime this afternoon or even tomorrow, even though that's Saturday, um, with links for the recordings and for evaluations as well as a um, link to the forum so that if you have additional questions, um, you can get those answered. So, If there's no additional questions, um, we'll go ahead and uh, close out for the day. So, thank you, everyone, and enjoy your weekend. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you.